Thank you very much. Happy Sabbath, everyone. This week, well, actually, let's start back at last Sabbath. We dedicated some children, little kids. It was a happy moment. This Friday, I put someone in the ground. You talk about life being fleeting and being short. Sometimes I ask myself, especially as a pastor, is my life really something that can be shared? Hmm, I wonder. Is your life retweetable? Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So if you don't mind, you'll just be blobs in the background. But if you don't mind, I need to tweet something. That's the most horrible picture I've taken of myself. Another. Oh, well, it's going out. That's just the way it is. Share with everybody around you that wants to care or uh, maybe ascribes to you, subscribes to you, what you're doing. Some of you, um, Facebook is about the limit, and some of you, a computer is the scariest thing on the planet. But is your life repeatable? This last week, as I was looking back and seeing the dedication of the children and seeing the innocence and the potential that was there. And then standing at a gravesite that one of the oldest cemeteries I've seen in a while and the guns going off saluting a veteran, saying goodbye to family, it made me pause as a pastor. Because in the span of six days, I went from beautiful potential to we're waiting for Jesus to come. And it gives you thought. What does my life mean? Do I really mean anything? Am I able to share with other people some little bit of knowledge? I mean, what if we ran around with these all day? Some of the the kids would be like, ah, that'd be cool. (laughs) I could tell what you're thinking. But what if we asked our neighbors around us to hold up little placards that were kind of their thoughts for the day? What would they be thinking? What would they be saying? What would they be interacting with us? What would they know about our church? Would it just be the billboard out front as they drive by? Or have they met you and understood, oh, I think I know something about those Seventh-day Adventist people. Some of you proclaim loudly, like I do. I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of things it means. Uh, Don't ask me difficult questions, Pastor. (laughs) I'm searching. I won't ask of, of you to raise your hands, but I know that there are people here in the audience and people watching online that are searching. Some that are needing a place to belong because in the world that's out there, it's kind of unkind and unfair, is it not? It's kind of brutal. And then occasionally I run across somebody that says, I will share my faith, but pastor, I really don't know how. We'd like you to turn your Bibles with me to that text that was just read so well. Our young people are very important to us, and um, we appreciate all of them. I'd like to see a little bit more of you up front, all of you, and some of you are like, I'm terrified, please don't ever say that again. But I'd like you to, because some of you are potential leaders. And adults, we have to lead by example, do we not? All right, chapter 14 of John, and I'm going to start with verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God or trust in God? Trust also in me. In my Father's house is just one room, correct? Many mansions, many rooms, many households. If it was not true, I what? I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you with me that you may also be where I am. 
you know the way to the place where I'm going. How many of you know the road to heaven? I see this, uh, road. <laughs> is it outside of town? Is it the bypass? Does it go right through town? I, I'm not sure where it goes. So Thomas, which we always call him the doubting Thomas, he says, Lord, um, we don't know where you're going. We haven't seen your GPS. He did not ex actually say that. I don't want to put per words, words in his mouth. But he said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, quite succinctly, and this is one of the most wonderful texts, actually, if you read it carefully. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There is no one comes to the Father except through me. I could preach a sermon on that for the rest of the year. Because we always forget it. Pastors always forget it. We understand that, you know, salvation is a neat kind of process with God. But sometimes we forget that Jesus, the person, the God, is in the center of it every, everything. Amen. And we always go, well, this is the way you get salvation. You need to read this text, this text, this text. Those are important. I understand. Those are important. We need to read those texts. But if we don't know whom we serve, it's going to be harder to explain to someone else who I serve. And take it from me, a sixth generation Preacher's kid. Uh, don't get any preconceived ideas because once I said preacher's kid, you guys started thinking naughty. I know it. <laughs> I know it. My family and friends are, are glad to be here today, but my children are just like your kids. Some days they're going to be angels and other days they're going to be angels of different types. <laughs> But aren't we all? Every day, if we tweeted actually every moment of what we did, if we shared on the internet what we were like, and it was just kind of a running commentary, would it not be like, right now I was thinking very good thoughts, and everybody was pleasant, and somebody just cut me off on the road, now I'm thinking very evil thoughts. I was studying my Bible today, and it was really great. God and I were really close, and then somebody called and just depressed the living daylights out of me, and now I am in a funk. Or I went to that appointment that I was supposed to get that job and they told me they gave it to somebody else and then we're tempted to cut the other person down. Oh, pastor, you don't know my family. They're complicated. Every time I go to one of those you know, family events, man, afterward, I am drained. I mean, everything is drained out of me. You just don't understand. Your family is not like that. I wish that was true. We all have a life that we're living. We start like the young people last week we saw, and we do inevitably, if Jesus does not come, end up in a grave with an epitaph written on a stone. Or in some cases, I saw that there was no stone. But the disciples, serving with Jesus, asked him one of the most important questions and he answered it with, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. There is no one that you can go through except me. And I mold that over a lot in my life, and I've, I've come to the conclusion that when Jesus says, he's not just talking about the surface stuff, he's talking about much deeper stuff. So if you want to unpack that, we can. It's just going to take a little bit of time. So we go on to verse 8. Philip said... Okay, introduce another disciple. Lord, show us the Father. That'll be enough for us. If we see God the Father, we will be great. You ever heard people say that? If I get, just could see God. You know, Moses tried that. He put a veil on for a long time because he was glowing. And he just saw God through the crack in a finger. Dangerous. 
Philip said, show us the Father. And Jesus answered, not how I would answer. I'd be like, no, I can't do that right now. Jesus answered in verse nine, says, do you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you so long? Took him back. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe in the evidence of the miracles yourself. Have you, like me, been faced with a really, really tough thing that is, feels like it's going to wreck you? And God says, have you not seen the miracles I've done for you? I'm like, yeah, 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 God, I, 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 I have. But this is really tough. This is really horrible. I don't feel like living really well right now. I'm, I'm really messed up. You wouldn't understand that. Whoops. Jesus, I guess, well, maybe you would. You see, if Jesus is the source of all things, you start to ponder, maybe God does get it. Because on purpose, he came out of heaven and decided, I'm going to pay the price for the ultimate sins. And you're not going to have to worry about sin anymore. You're just going to have to worry about following me because I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Jesus is the source. The sanctuary, I'd love to unpack that sometime, but that would take a whole couple of years too. But the sanctuary is the way that God painted for the people in live action how his salvation plan was going to work in the future. And it's really neat for us to go back and look and see how God planned everything to the detail of even Jesus' legs not being broken and what was going to be shoved in his mouth. It was all there beforehand. And who do we go to? The Heavenly Father for mercy. Relationships with God. Hmm. I read down a little bit further, and I'm not going to read it verse for verse, letter for letter, because that's already been read once. But isn't it interesting that he's talking to the disciples and he's saying, I'm here. Have you ever been in a place where you're talking to somebody and they're there? I'm guilty of that, sorry. When you come to God in prayer or anything, you have his full undivided attention and he says, I get you. I understand you. I'm here for you. And then our response is, yeah, God, this, that, and the other thing. Really, our response needs to be, God, you are almighty. I trust you. I understand. Okay. Are you wanting to come up this morning? Or would you like to wait? talk about your brother? No, okay. I'll see you at home, okay? When we lose people, I don't think you understand the hole that they leave. Because all of us in the last number of years have all felt that hole. When we look at our lives and we realize that relationship is the most important thing in Christianity, when we lose one of our friends, one of our family, it leaves a hole, not just an empty seat. And so when we look through the life that we have, suddenly we realize that when Jesus is interacting with these people, that this is one of the most important things on the planet. Relationships. In fact, in the Old Testament, God desired so much to be with his people, he said, I'm going to tabernacle with you. 
I'm going to come be with you. I'm going to put my house there, and I'm going to live with you. Hmm. Start on the right-hand side. Isn't that cute? Looks like the picture was taken in the 70s. It just has that hue, right? Teenagers, young adults, seems like you guys are hanging out on the left-hand side there. Not a care in the world. Death will never touch me. I have everything to look forward to. Then some of us that are a little advanced in years and experienced, we start contemplating what we've done in the past and where we're going to go in the future. And then those that are at the end of our maturity, we start looking and saying, was my life at least valuable to some? But in all actuality, don't we all think that way? The reason why a number of my young people that are actually watching online right now, the reason why they haven't darkened a door in a couple months or a couple years, some of them, is because they felt hurt because somebody said or did something to them. Somebody offhandedly said something on Facebook or Twitter or they just, to their face, just weren't that kind and they left. Now, I'm not going to put blame anywhere. Because sometimes our feelings are raw, and when somebody says something to us, they don't have a clue what we're going through right now. It can hurt really deep, and the person didn't mean it. Or sometimes they did, and they just didn't know any better. God desires to be so close to us, he looks at us and says, I don't care where you're at. I don't care what's going on. In fact, he has two disciples here, and he could have been like, um, excuse me, Thomas, you doubt everything. How could you? He could have said, Philip, come on, you're kind of a coward here. What in the world's going on? But he didn't. He went back to the basics and said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Hmm. Have you read that text that says in John here, if you've seen me, you've what? Hmm. I have a little acronym. What's the uh, initials for Madison East? M-E. Wouldn't that be cool? If they've seen us, they've seen the Father. What would that be like? Think in your minds, what would it be like when somebody comes through the doors or you meet somebody here or you meet your friends here? What would that mean? How would we treat people? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Whoa, readjust, Pastor. <laughs> Do we let the people see the Father in us? Look at this picture. What are these guys doing? Who are they? A father's son. You know how I know? Because the look on the son's face is, Dad, do we have to be here? <laughs> and the dad's giving a grin. Yes, we have to be here. And inside he's like, I think I'm going to die. <laughs> this kid's killing me. He is, he's really, really fast. I don't know if I can keep up with him. So I'm going to give him some insights right now while I catch my breath. But our Heavenly Father is not so different than that. When he's giving instruction to these disciples, I see over and over again that Jesus doesn't lash out like sometimes I do. He says to the disciples, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And then he unpacks it. I'm the way. Hmm. Back then, that was the name of the church. I am the vehicle that you get I am the one that will draw you where I need to draw you. I am the one that makes sure that you get where you need to go in spite of the fact that sometimes you take the wrong road or don't ask for directions, gentlemen. It's interesting that God cares so much about us that he says, I've got you. I will act as a father to you. I will give you direction.
Be truthful. Is this your picture of God? Some of you it's not. But is it not, is it not sometimes the picture we get of God that he's waiting on his throne for you to make a mistake? Can I have a witness? Yes. <laughs> it's terrible. But that's really what happens to us. Is that we've been lied to so many times over our lives that we actually started to believe that the Heavenly Father was the chief God and he's angry. Zeus. Worshiping the wrong God. Because what does the God, the Father, what does he sit on? You're going to hear me say this a lot. He sits on the mercy seat. Jesus is the judge. We'll go into that later. God the Father sits on the mercy seat. I don't like to look at that picture. Let's get fast or forward that one. <laughs> what does God have to do with me tweeting about my life? What does God have to do with my life in general? What are the things that God can really teach me so that my life is a little bit better than it used to be? Will you turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'm going to read verse 19. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about Corinth. Corinth was an interesting town. They had a bunch of temples, but one was very predominant. And that one was the one that was dedicated to a female goddess. That's kind of a redundant statement, a goddess. And she was the goddess of love. And she had a lot of prophetesses. Actually, they weren't prophetesses, but this is rated G. So I'll just let your, yeah. Anyhow, kids, ask your parents later, okay? So we're dealing with a lot of things that people really don't understand unless you lived in an area that was given over to this kind of behavior. Um, it's, it's interesting. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Sometimes we read things and we read it from our point of view, not realizing that the people that live there, their life may be a little bit different than we are expecting. And verse 19 says this. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. And I will let you extrapolate what it was talking about to the people that it was talking about. But it says something very important to us as Christians. Because today, who am I? If you identify as a Christian, that means you're a follower of Christ. If you say that you're a follower of Christ, what really does that mean? Well, let's start in the beginning. An innocent child. Last week, when do the babies cry? When the pastor pinches them. No, that's not when the babies cry. When they are hungry. When they need to be hugged. When they need security. And sometimes when they're tired. And that doesn't change until you're 99.9. <laughs> but you're born into the world that says, me first. We are. Me first. And the world that we live in is de totally dependent on our parent. If the parent ceases to exist, so does the child. They cannot fend for themselves at that age. And they trust others for everything. That, if we could do that as adults? Wouldn't it be neat if we could trust every single one of everybody that we meet out there for all of our needs? That just be, would be a weird world. But it would be refreshing. All right, then we go on to a little bit older. And we ha have this discovery. And by the way, discovery happens three times in life. And some of you are in the third. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Discovery. You start meeting people and you have a little bit of a personality. And sometimes you learn now that people can disappoint you. And you find out that some people don't like you. And some of you never recover. <laughs> no, then you find out some people love you. And that kind of erases both of the first two things. 
and you find out what true love means, that it has no conditions, that it has nothing that says you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, if you're in a relationship like that, please come see the pastor or the elders. We'd like to talk to you. But when you find out somebody loves you with an unending kind of love, that's an attraction. Because when you find out that, you kind of find out what God is like a little bit. Greater love has no one than this, than they lay down their life for another. We're not there yet, folks. We're not there. Because what that implies is, you know the person that you don't like? You die for them. We're not there. I'm not there. I'm not going to ask for a hand. Is anybody there? <laughs> because inevitably there's a child that has simplistic trust, and I do not want to destroy that. All right, self-reliance phase, yeah. Do you remember the day you graduated from high school or college? Yes, hopes and dreams. And some of you are like, I will never graduate. <laughs> and you're a senior this year. <laughs> we get into that self-reliance phase and we're like, oh yes, I think I can make it. This is great, everything looks great. In fact, we make some of our best relationships during this time that last the longest, even for a lifetime. We test to see if our visions of the world really matter, and sometimes we come to a crashing conclusion that I had a really weird view of the world. The question is asked among the young people and adults, we need to pay attention to this, and I don't even know what adulting is because occasionally I have to do it. But the question is, can I grow and people give me slack? Can we have kids that do things in this church and even on behalf of this church and we cut them slack? And that's for you older kids too that are in your mid-60s and 70s and beyond. And during this phase, you find out if anyone really cares and that actually continues on. Taking you through a journey here today. Kind of a journey through life. Is your life up to now Something you can share. All right, and then we come to a maturity. Um, true maturity basically is death, so none of us really want to be that mature. But we come to a point in our life where we feel secure in who we are and what we understand, and we're willing to share that with people. Uh, for some of you, it's simply baking a loaf of bread and giving it to someone so that someone can have nourishment. Some, it is sharing some of the experiences that you have and showing that God is in fact there through everything. Some of you, it's knowledge where you can share with them what's in the Bible. Some of them, maybe a, that you have talents that you could do a roofing project and help somebody that really needs it and cannot afford it. You may not be able to handle all the materials and things like that, but you can put a good hammer and uh, some nails on and you know how to put a roof on. Some of you may be able to have talents that I definitely do not have, and you'd like to share them with music or with internet or with um, just one-on-one -on -one people, uh, skills that you have that you can share with other people, that you're secure enough to share those, even if it's limited, to be able to share those with other people, because relationships are important, are they not? In fact, how many of you have a Twitter account? Not as many as I thought, okay. How many of you have a Facebook account? Ah, I see, okay. How many of you have a MySpace account? Oops. I just showed my age, whoops. How many of you have Instagram? Um, and I forgot the new one that's kind of like Twitter. Well, Snapchat too, how many have a Snapchat? Okay, there's other media. I mean, we could go on all day. There's so many of them. But who do you share your information with? Who do you share your life experiences with? Did you realize that there are many, many people that if you share your experiences with, if you add the God concept to it or the God part, that those people, if they're close enough to you, should listen? You know what God's done for me today? Bloop. 
you only have so many characters, I'm glad it's more than it used to be because when the old Twitter accounts happened, you had this many letters. I think that's why hashtags were invented. It was like one word that was like six words all in one, but you didn't want to put spaces between it. But if you're willing to share, God says, I am the bread of life. I will nourish. I did not take this picture. In fact, I took it off of a site that's, uh, that's free. I can use it. Um, but I have a picture that's a little bit further away. And if you want to see that, you can go to my Twitter account. It's there. There's little teeny buildings about this big. Reaching Madison, Wisconsin. I know there are two churches and lots of Seventh-day Adventists around and some in. For some of us, it's going on the corner and handing out literature. That's scary. For some, it's preaching on the corner and saying, repent lest you die, tomorrow God is coming, right? That won't get you very far. <laughs> really, the only place that we can meet people and the places that we can influence people are the places that we frequent all the time. The places that we meet people and that we're real with people. How many of you, when you come, that's not a question a pastor should ever ask, never mind. When you go to a favorite restaurant and you're meeting with your friends, are you not a little more open than you are sometimes when you meet a stranger? Some of you are like, no. And some of you are like, stranger, I never meet them, that's danger. I'm comfortable here in the pew. I'm a sixth generation Seventh-day Adventist. I am comfortable in the pew also, but I'm comfortable bringing my friends to meet you because I trust you. I trust that you will tell them about the Jesus I know. I trust you because I can't bring all of Madison into this church. They can't fit. But what I can do is I can bring friends here and I will trust you that you will show them Jesus and that you will be the father to them. And then I will get here and I'll be like, hey, <laughs> can you hang out beside me, my friend here? Let's just take a little selfie here because I want to show people how nice you are. Because people nowadays, let me be totally honest with you, you can tell them Bible studies, you can give them all kinds of reasons why they should become Seventh-day Adventists. But what they're looking for really is you, a friend. Amen. Because this world, we have lots of connectivity. I mean, I do. I have connections. I have over a thousand some friends on here that I keep in contact with. But I don't see many of them. But when you get to see them and you hug them and you talk to them and you're interacting with them, it is so much better to catch up that way than to catch them on a screen. And that is the desire of even the youngest members of our church, to have that connection with someone. And you know what Jesus said in John 14? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through Hmm. The word through is packed right there. Through means you need to become my friend. You need to become my disciple. You need to become part of my church. You need to become part of what I am and what I share with the world. That's what God's saying. I want you to be part of my family. Through just one little word. And we find it so difficult as Christians sometimes to share because we look at the city and we're like, I don't even know how I'm going to do that. There's your answer. Not an idol. This is the only free picture I could find that was decent. <laughs> if we teach Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life, all we have to worry about is friendships. Because if we worry about friendships, we're not worried about what people do. It's important, believe me. What people do is important. God wants you to get rid of the things that hurt you. I know. But friendships are the most important thing. So is your life retweetable? I'm not even sure if that's a word. Is your life shareable? 
Is your life something that you would like to post? Is your life something that you can fit within just a little thing that says so much that when they see it, they go, that's God talking through that person. I want that. That's attractive to me because I am really lost in this world. I don't have a direction. I give a good face on the weekends or even when I'm around my friends. But I'm really lost because I don't have that one, that God thing. I live something that's kind of godly, but I desire something more. Let's go back to that reading we started with early on here. John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms or mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. There is room. Look beside you. How many spaces are there beside you? Like, not enough. My bubble's huge. I'm going to preach this early on because I don't want it to come across as sarcastic because I don't know many of you. But I want you to ask the question, if someone came and sat in your seat today, would you know what to do? I know. It's tough. I am a, I am a person of habit. And if I came into the church and somebody was sitting in my seat in the office, I would be like, oh, we have a new pastor. Because are we not all pastors? Are we not all conduits for God's message? Are we not all people of influence in our workplace, in the places that we frequent? Can I possibly get to all those places as the pastor? No. So the outreach in this church is going to fall on all of our shoulders. It's a scary concept for some of you because you're like, oh, my tongue gets in like a thousand knots, but when the Holy Spirit speaks, it's loosened. And all you have to do is say, I care about you and give people hugs if they want it. <laughs> don't do it if they don't. <laughs> and tell them that you really care. Look at them in the eye and mean that you care about them. And guess what happens? An explosion in their mind. They can't fathom it because no one in this world really cares that much because don't we say, I'll pray for you? I'm guilty of it. I'll pray for you. That means I'll think of you. And maybe I'll pray just if I remember. But wouldn't it be better if we were as, as a congregation to say, I'll be there with you. When do you want me to come over? What can I do for you? I know I have a ton of things to do and the house is a mess. But if you want to come on over, it's okay. Because I want to be there for you. Because is that not what Jesus says? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means he's walking with us the whole time. Is that not what God says to us and says, I'm, I'm going to take special attention to you and I'm going to be there for life? I'm a preacher's kid. It's easy for me to say, I'll give you Bible studies, I'll dunk you in the baptistry, and then you're, you're a member. Hands off. That's not how things work. I'm going to invest in the rest of your life. That's why when Pastor Titus physically left this building and went up north, he will never leave your hearts and minds because he said, I'm investing forever. Amen. That's what all of us pastors, we have that heart. We know that it's a lifelong investment because you're worth it. And Jesus says, I'll do that for you. God the Father says, mercy, I have it for everyone. Jesus says, I judge for you. And the Holy Spirit says, I won't stop whispering. I would like you to be part of our family. So as we look at all the things that we have to look at today, I would like you to look at this final picture. Just keep looking at it. Keep it in the center of what you are. 
get a better one that's color and everything if you're not into like, you know, images and things like that. But if Jesus is the center of everything that we do, the question that we posed at the beginning, is your life retweetable, will become absolutely yes, because you're necessary. Our Father in heaven, Jesus, Holy Spirit, what we have, dear Father, from you is something that we could share with this world and it would turn it upside down. The message that's proclaimed about you that is inclusive, the message that says that our lives do matter, the message that says that we must proclaim what we know because we have a, an awesome God, a God that cares about individuals so much that he was willing to sacrifice himself for us. Dear Father, we also offer friendships, discipleship. And dear Father, that is actually the meaning of church. Because dear Father, we do have these walls, but we, dear Father, are the church. Help us, dear Father, as we see people around us to not be afraid, to tell them little snippets about our relationship with Jesus and how it has changed our lives. Dear Father, I pray that you will help us to have a life that is truly something that can go viral because people desire what you have. So be with us this Sabbath and this week as we come in contact with people. Pour your Holy Spirit upon us, dear Father, so that we can point people to you because, Jesus, you are the way. You are the truth. And you are, in fact, our life. In Jesus' name, amen.